Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'd first like to start off by introducing our, our speakers. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Dr. Sayyid Hussein Nasser, who has lectured at RAS several times in the past, so many of you know him um, just from your experience here, is University Professor of Islamic Studies at the George Washington University. He has published over 50 books and hundreds of articles in the fields of Islamic studies, uh, mysticism, comparative religion, and many other subjects. And in addition, he has mentored countless students in a career spanning over 60 years. Dr. Bruno Guidardoni is a scientific researcher and scholar of international stature, whose main research field is in galaxy formation, uh, a subject in which he has published more than 140 papers and organized several conferences. In addition to his scientific work, he has also published dozens of papers and given many lectures on Islamic subjects in France and elsewhere. Our two speakers both come to this subject from two sides, you might say. Dr. Nasser began his academic career in the sciences having graduated from MIT with a degree in physics and then getting a master's at Harvard in geology and geophysics before moving on to a PhD in the history and philosophy of science, before returning to Iran where he continued his academic work while also studying in the traditional Islamic fields with traditional masters. Dr. Giderdoni embraced Islam, and, and please correct me if I have this detail wrong, around the same time he also became a professional astrophysicist. And alongside his professional work, he has done much to cultivate an understanding for the public of Islam's emphasis on knowledge, as a unified activity, and he's given many lectures on Islam's view of nature and its added towards toward knowledge and inquiry. And with that, I'd like to invite our speakers to the stage. This is a vast subject, uh, and we have these two great minds with us to discuss um, uh, something which we could really spend the entire conference talking about. So, but I did want to get started. Dr. Guidardoni, if you could help us just with terminology, and if you could uh, tell us uh, what is modern cosmology, just as a definition, what, what is it, um, what is the modern understanding of it, and what does it include, and also what does it exclude? Maybe we can go back to the etymology uh, of the word cosmology. Cosmos in Greek means uh, a whole which is ordered and beautiful. And the Greeks, the Greeks were thinking that the, the world was beautiful. And now, uh, after a long period of absence of interest for cosmology during the uh, uh, 19th century, we have the possibility to describe the universe around us on very large scales. This is modern cosmology. And, and the landscape that we uh, discover is amazing because we see a universe which is much larger than what we were thinking in the past. And this universe is full of galaxies and stars hundred billions of galaxies, each galaxy includes hundreds of billions of stars, hundreds of billions of, uh, of planets. And so we have this view of a large and old universe, and this universe is still a cosmos, because it is ordered by, by laws, and the origin of the laws is still a mystery for modern cosmology, for modern science. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Nasser, your first book was called An Introduction to Islamic Cosmological Doctrines, um, which was one of the earliest um, significant contributions to the study of that area. But could you describe what is meant by cosmology in the traditional sense? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, before I begin, I want to say that I'm very happy to be able to be here, Dr. Calderoni. 
uh, his spiritual teacher, the late Abdul Wahid Palavicini, was like a brother of mine who came to Islam, the gift that Allah Ta'ala gave me through, through my discussion with him in Tehran in the 1960s. So we have a spiritual link together, although we speak from the point of view of Western astrophysics, I speak from the point of view of traditional Islamic cosmology. As that point of view, which I'm presenting to you, of course, uh, both of these uses of the word cosmology, both of these uses of the word cosmology, excuse me, goes back to the Greek word cosmos. But I want to emphasize that the word cosmos in Greek has two meanings: one is order, and one is beauty. One is order, and one is beauty both of which are emphasized very strongly in the Qur'an concerning God's creation. Ma khalaqna hadha batala, God says in the Qur'an, there's, there's, it's in truth, not in butlan, in error or falsehood that the world is created. And says God is beautiful, his creation is also beautiful. So the Muslims inherited this term, but uh, that it was not used in Arabic, but the ideas behind it, they incorporated with the Islamic idea of the cosmos, and from that was born Islamic cosmology. In our tradition, cosmology is really the science of all that is other than God, Masawallah. All that is below the level of the absolute divine reality of God, which transcends the cosmos, is cosmology. And therefore, by definition, it embraces not only the physical world, the visible world, and not even only the psychophysical world, but all the worlds and grades of being, the angelic, the archangelic, the imaginal, and so forth and so on, which over the centuries, the Islamic uh, thinkers have developed extensively. Islam has one of the richest resources for the study of cosmology in the traditional sense. And for us, the cosmos is a totality of which the modern cos cos cosmos, with all of its extension of millions of years and billions of zeros added, is like a speck of dust on the ocean compared to the vast reality of the world beyond, and of course, beyond that God. But there's one thing which uh, we, and of course, Dr. Gordon is a very devout Muslim, but in addition to that, being a scientist, a major scientist in the world in his field, agree upon those scientists who are theistic is that this vast cosmos is created by God, is uh, and sustained by God. Where his laws come from and so forth are other matters of difference. But it's very important in this short debate, unfortunately, we have together to distinguish between the very term cosmology as used in Islamic languages, al malkaun and so forth and so on, uh, and the use of cosmology as it was transformed during the Renaissance, from the cosmology and cosmography of the Renaissance with all the books published in his original country, Italy, and gradually in the West and after Galileo. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Giderdoni, this is an open-ended question, but I wanted to ask, what does Islam get right about cosmology that modern science gets wrong about cosmology? As Professor Nasr was saying, the vast expanses of space and time that we observe is just one level of reality. It's a lot of, of space, a lot of time, a lot of matter, but it's a thin layer, a thin plane in the multiple states of being which are described in uh, Islamic thinking and especially in Islamic mysticism. This world with respect to the divine pedestal is like a, a ring from in the desert, a ring thrown in the desert. So we, we are seeing a large expanse, but this is material quantity. And, and this physical world is not self-sufficient because it is ordered by mathematical laws. And we don't know the origin of these mathematical laws, except if we are a believer, but because for a believer, there is wisdom, there is intelligence, 
in the cosmos. And the origin of his intelligence and wisdom is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Khaliq al-Musab, the one who creates, the one who gives uh, shape to the things. So this is fundamental because, we, unfortunately, in, in uh, modern cosmology, we have lost the sense of the ontology, the sense of metaphysics. People are so fascinated by the results of modern science that they don't, don't ask anymore the fundamental questions about what is real, what is the meaning of our lives, why the, is the cosmos so beautiful, what does it teach to us, what does it mean for us as individuals, as human beings on the spiritual journey towards God. And that's the problem with modern science. It's not so much the method of science, it's not so much even the results of science, because these results change, they are, they are changing, they are improving sometimes. We ask questions, sometimes we have the answer, and the answers to our questions give birth to other questions, so it's an endless quest. The problem is with the interpretation of science and the use of science in society. These are the problems. And since we have lost the, mathematical, the metaphysical perspective, we have lost the metaphysical perspective, we are doing a lot of wrong with science. We are thinking that science is leading necessarily to atheism, which is not true, and we are using science for uh, the development of a materialistic society, which is not the goal of knowledge. The goal of knowledge is to bring us closer to, to God. And that's the problem with modern science. Would you like to add? Uh, the question was, what does Islam get right about cosmology that modern science gets wrong about cosmology? Uh, much that he said I agree with, but I am a bit more radical in my criticism. Uh, because in modern science, if you're a serious scientist, the question of God or the spiritual world is irrelevant. That is, a science considers itself to be independent of metaphysics, of religion, of revelation. There are individuals who Christians who are both physicists and theologians or Muslims like him or devout Muslims and astrophysicists. That has nothing to do with the field of modern science itself with drugs and cosmology. It's a worldview independent of any agent outside of the physical world which it considers to be the only reality. Going back really to the bifurcation of the car in which you put all the qualitative value-laden aspects of life in the subjective pole, uh, in, in the cogitans, uh, rest cogitans, rather than rest extensa, the world out there, the world of extension. So you mean when Descartes, the early mod when the, in the early modern period, who he separated the world essentially into the world of machines That's right. and the world of minds? You see, uh, before the 17th century, in the West even, before modern science really arose in the hands of Descartes and Galileo and those people, the worldview of Christian West, the Christian West, very similar to that of Islam. St. Thomas Aquinas, after all, read the Messina and 500, over 500 references to Ibn Sina. 500 in the writings of St. Thomas, the founder of Catholic theology for 700, and sustainer. Catholic theology for 700 years. I mean medieval Catholic theology, not St. Augustine, of course. Now, uh, in that time, this extreme separation between the knower and the known in the Cartesian sense did not exist in Western thought. There was a relation between the subject and the object. And uh, Thomism, St. Thomas, others write extensively about this, very similar to Islamic view. There must be a relation between al-alum wal ma'lum. The word for in Arabic for the world is al-alam. That which can be known is related to the act of knowledge. And alam, he's an alam. He's a science scientist, a scholar. Uh, I, there has to be a relation through alam between the two. Now, this was uh, in a kind of uh, pseudo miraculous way, you might say, in a kind of magical way, done away with, done away with, and so. Uh, the aspect of the relation with the world of nature uh, was reduced to the fact that somehow the subject can know the world of nature without anything of the world of 
of itself being related to the world of nature, somehow out there. And most scientists have not been able to evade this. There are now some new, uh, some modern uh, physicists uh, in quantum mechanics, like our friend Wolfgang Smith, who was going to be here. He may have, I don't know whether you've read some of his works, remarkable uh, physicist, who in fact said that it goes back to the error of this bifurcation and there is no ultimate separation between the knower and the known. And Islamic cosmology is based on that. So we are critical of this uh, trunc truncation of the very methods of knowing the world and also reducing what can be known to only the material, to the rest of the There's been a lot of expansion, but really all of modern science, strictly speaking, goes back to the expansion, expansion of the meaning that the cut gave to rest extensa. And we do not accept that because we believe that human intelligence given by God is such that it's even able to know God. So in a sense, what happens is the, uh, the, the world of nature, the world of the stars, the world of the cosmos just becomes cut off. It's, there's no real way to account for how it is that we as people, who, as human beings who have knowledge, can even have a relationship with that world, much less be able to say something absolute about it and say that it, it would say something about its nature. And actually, the, this trajectory brings us to my next question, which is this kind of ultimate uh, reduction of things, not only to mind and to matter, but then mind is, in a sense, washed away and you're left only with matter. And you have statements like the following, which I want to ask your opinion on since it relates to cosmology. And this is a quote from Stephen Hawking about whom there was a film recently, and he's one of the most, Stephen Hawking, yes. <laughs> um, who says, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God. And then he continues. Now, this is really, people, because of the prestige of science, because of the prestige and the fame of people like Hawking and his scientific achievements, they think that this statements like this uh, and many other similar statements have a kind of firm grounding to them. But really, it's a purely philosophical statement. And in a sense, a kind of absurd philosophical statement because he's saying that you can have spontaneous creation from, from nothing. I, could, I, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. I was wondering if you could both respond to uh, that statement of Hawking and uh, yeah, yeah. Its, its problems. A, it's a typical example of those philosophers and scientists that Imam al-Ghazali was mentioning in his book, uh, uh, al munqib min al-Dalal. Those scientists who are venturing out of a uh, range of validity of reason to utter statements about God which are not valid. And, and so the message proposed by Imam al-Ghazali centuries ago is still valid for today, for this kind of a scientist. It's absurd because there cannot be creation uh, in physics, creation of uh, something from nothing. There is no nothing in uh, the description of the universe by uh, Hawkins. There is the law of gravity. There is the gravity field. And the nature of the fields is something very puzzling in science. So who created the law of gravity? Who created the law of gravity that makes the universe uh, structure, the galaxies appear, the stars, the planets? Uh, uh, we don't know why there is a law of gravity. We don't know why there are laws in nature. This is something very puzzling for the materialists. Of course, a few centuries ago, laws were uh, designed as uh, our own description of matter. But now we cannot uh, speak about matter without uh, mentioning the mathematical structure of matter. Matter is nothing more than mathematical entities. Where uh, do these mathematical entities come from? It's, it's something very puzzling. And uh, uh, Hawkins is, is not mentioning that. It's, it's, it's a kind of a uh, 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 smoke that he is putting on the real problem of modern science, which is not addressing the 
origin of the laws. And for a believer, of course, the laws come from the lawgiver. Uh, I mean, there are uh, the sunnah uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to uh, rule in creation, uh, to rule creation with habits, awaid, uh, with habits. And uh, these habits are described by our mathematics, but there are these habits, there are these regularities, which are God's trace in, in the world. And, and so, uh, science does not lead necessarily to atheism. It's true that most scientists now are atheists. It's true, most scientists are materialists, because most of our fellow citizens are atheists and materialists. They are not better, the scientists are not better than the other people. Eh? But it's not a, a necessary conclusion, a necessary interpretation of modern science. And the hope is that we can address science to put it at its proper level in the, in the scale of knowledge. It's not a very high level. Uh, we totally agree on that. There are levels of knowledge which are much higher than that, because, uh, of course, as human beings, we are uh, engaging in a journey towards uh, uh, the knowledge of God. Uh, we, this is our goal as human beings. But uh, we, we have to address the issue of science. Otherwise, uh, we, we, are, we are going to be in some way polluted by science, either because we, are, uh, we doubt our religion or because we become uh, fundamentalists that we don't want to hear about science, or, and that's um, more subtle, uh, because we, uh, we are polluted by science in our own religion. We import scientism within our own religion. For instance, when we say, okay, I know that the Quran is true because there are scientific statements in the Quran. SubhanAllah, it's not necessary to see the truth of the Quran the truth of the Quran comes from its beauty, from its light. It doesn't come from science. And this is the kind of subtle influence that we have to identify in order to protect ourselves and to put uh, scientific knowledge at its proper level. Thank you very much, Dr. Gider Doni. Uh, Dr. Nasser, uh, Dr. Gider Doni mentioned Ghazali, who in this context is very important. Um, Ghazali is even mentioned by modern popularizers of science, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, as being responsible for the backwardness or the anti-scientific attitude of Islam because his criticism of philosophy and of natural philosophers, he, he says, um, destroyed the spirit of rational or scientific inquiry in the Islamic world. And this even makes its way into modern political attacks against the Islamic world. It makes its way into the um, sort of tirades of Islamophobes, Islam is anti-rational, it's anti-scientific and so forth. I was wondering if you could say something about the, the, um, the way in which Ghazali features into this story of Islam's relationship with science and maybe dispel some of the mis misunderstandings that arise in this connection. Because you're asking one of the most important questions which faces people who are trying to study Islam today, including a large number of younger Muslims in the West who are studying from Western sources. Uh, this is a long story I have to shorten, we really do not have time. But Ghazali was sort of picked by Western Orientalism as a key person to study uh, the Islamic intellectual life from a very particular point of view. And uh, people like Goldseher, other famous Orientalists, concentrated much of attention on Ghazali and the criticism of rationalism and of reason. And the story was like this. All right, for a while, Europe and uh, the Islamic world were like sister civilizations, but then there came along Ghazali, prevented the Muslims from thinking, and uh, Europeans did not have a Ghazali. Unfortunately, they produced Albert Einstein. That's the, that's the, that's the heart of the, this asinine, very stupid argument. Uh, in fact, it's a much more profound question. Why is it that Descartes was not born in Khorasan? Why was he born in Paris? Why was Galileo born in Italy and not in Egypt? I've written a lot about this, but I have not time to go into it now. But in fact, it is the presence in Islam 
of a knowledge of a sapiental order of gnosis, of marva, of uh, philosophy in the traditional sense of hikmah, that in fact prevented this from happening. What Ghazali did was not to destroy rational thought. He destroyed the possibility of rationalism, which is a very different thing. If the Westerners are unhappy that Ghazali did that, they should be happy. Otherwise, as I said, the atomic bomb would have made in Khorasan, Oppenheimer would be from Nejabur. Uh, that could, could have happened historically. Uh, so uh, the question is that Ghazali attacked the power of rationalism to stand opposed to its tenets of faith. He had read the Messina. He, knew, he, had read, he wrote a book on logic, Ghazali. He's not illogical, he's not Ibn Taymiyyah, Raddu ala al-Mantaq, refutation of logic. He, he wrote a book on logic, Ghazali. It wasn't that he was against thinking. He, he was a turning of the stream in which Islamic thought essentially turned more and more towards inwardness, towards ashraq, to the school of illumination, to other modes of thought, to tasawwuf, while not disbanding uh, science, because in the 13th century after Ghazali, you have Qutbuddin Shirazi, Nasiruddin Tusi, the whole revival of Islamic science, some of the greatest physicists opt in the field of optics in the, in the history of science lived actually after Ghazali, Muslims. Uh, so this, this is not what happened. And uh, finally, this is an important issue. Now that the blind application of modern science is killing us all, if Galileo had remained only in the library, there would not have been the environmental crisis that we have. But we have the application of all these things. As soon as something is made in order to make money, it's applied no matter what its consequences for the world in which we live. Now that we have this crisis, we should be intelligent enough to say, thank God there was a Ghazali who prevented from the Khorasan becoming as polluted as Detroit. Uh, if you look at the history of the world, Altogether, you will see that uh, if the rest of the world had started like the West with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, we would not be around right now. And the fact that the Islamic world, which has such a remarkable science in physics and mathematics and astronomy, you know very, you know very well. If you had continued along and developing a kind of uh, science independent of the religious worldview, like the West did, we would not be around. The whole earth would have been destroyed. So uh, I don't want to make a virtue out of necessity. Uh, there have been great Islamic thinkers that have been critical of Ghazali, including Mullah Sadra, but also defenders of some of his ideas. This idea that Islam stopped thinking because of Ghazali is totally false. I mean, you're a scholar of Islam, you know yourself. Also, the, not only in Persia, because I mentioned Mullah Sadra, in the Sunni world, all the later philosophical Sufism that developed in Egypt, in, Magh in the Maghreb, and so on and so on, is very much related to Ghazali and related to the intellectual life for centuries of a part of the world, a very large part of the world. Just so just to follow up on that, Dr. Nasser, I want to ask you uh, 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 and Dr. Gidadoni two related questions. What should the what should the Islamic world do? What should the Muslim majority world do in this area in terms of steps to take maybe in education or in policy or what have you? In other words, there's a sense in which, at least philosophically, you both definitely agree that in this respect, in modern cosmology, it's on the wrong track, I mean, intellectually speaking. What, what are steps or approaches that one could take to correct and to head in a better direction? We have now a major crush in the Islamic world. Because in some countries, you have both the madrasa system continuing and the modern education system. In some countries, the madrasa system was destroyed or uh, modified to a large extent, like in Libya, places like that, but not going to uh, special uh, uh, examples. But uh, the general public, which goes to state-run schools or now private schools in a Western style, all they're studying is Western science. They're not studying traditional Islamic science. Islam is two hours on the Sharia, you study how to make ablutions, which is very necessary, alhamdulillah. At best, a little about ethics, but not about the nature of reality. 
Islamic understanding of the nature of reality, what metaphysics really is, or is not taught in schools in the Islamic world. But uh, belief is still there. The vast majority of people still live in that world. And that's why you have an inward paralysis that has been created by introducing the Western educational system, run mostly by Catholics now. In, I've said that often in Pakistan, a country in which four million people died because of in partition in order to create it. From the time of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Pakistan is like a, my own country, I can speak openly about it. 90% of the children of the elite of Pakistan, generals, heads of banks, ministers, and so forth, so on, go to Western schools, go to Catholic schools. 90%. It's as if 90% of all Americans went to, to a Wahhabi school in Texas. That, that, that's exactly what is happening. And, but what we ha should do, I think, is three steps. So first of all, revive our own educational system in its fullness. And we should have a contemporary madrasa, like Musan Sariya or like the old Asar, all subjects. In Al Asar, physics was taught in the yes. fifth Islamic century. It isn't like now, it was the teach only Islamic law and things like that. Uh, secondly, on the base of that, on the base of that, then to study Western subjects. And so look upon West, know the Western subjects, but know it from an Islamic point of view. And thirdly, to be able then to create arts and sciences which are rooted in our own tradition, but also take into consideration what is positive that Western science has developed shorn of the limitations which his worldview has imposed upon it. This would be the ideal program. And I've talked about this so many decades, that one or two places in Malaysia, other places, that small experiments in Pakistan right now, in Iran, they're trying to do it. But we need a much larger engagement in this matter, and inshallah, it can still be done. Uh, Dr. Gidor, don't anything that you wanted to say on that topic, but especially I had a question for you about Many young Muslims, uh, they tend to prefer going into the sciences, uh, either engineering or they go into other fields which are in the sciences. And as we know, science is not only a method, it's not just a pure uh, set of practices, but it's a community, it's a set of institutions. Uh, there's a kind of um, authority within it. And it's not always easy if an individual wants to make his way through that as a believing Muslim, as someone of faith coming from his own principle. Even within modern science, even for those who are not people of faith, those who hold heterodox ideas about, let's say, uh, the nature of galaxy formation or quantum mechanics or what have you, they're often ostracized or they have a hard time practically speaking. And so the, the, the central part of my question is, what are some ways that Muslims who are actually in the sciences right now and who don't really have a real it's, how can they cope with their situation? Like, how can they shield themselves and guard themselves or frame their practice so that they can have integrity within themselves, but also while being able to succeed or do well outwardly in their profession? Yeah. The, the problem is that uh, universities in, in, in Europe and the US and Canada have lost their, their true meaning, which is universal. They are not universal anymore. You were mentioning the fact that in the old uh, madaris, in the old schools, every uh, field of knowledge was taught to students from metaphysics to mathematics and physics, going through uh, sharia, kalam, and so on. And, and so we have lost that in, uh, in the major universities of, of the world. We have lost the universality of knowledge and we have restricted ourselves to very specific levels. Uh, there is a, a list, I don't know it, it, what, what uh, context, a list of all the sciences which are currently developed in universities. There are 3,000 different sciences, 3,000 different branches of science. And so we are uh, training experts in one very specific field and total ignorance in all the other fields, especially in, in the, what is uh, the, the ground in which knowledge uh, grows, which is metaphysics. We are, we are in need of metaphysics. 
And my hope is that in the development of uh, the new development of universities in the Arab Islamic world, uh, this uh, vocation of, uh, of uh, the universities to, to reach a real un universalism is going to be fulfilled. Huh? The un universalism, yeah, we can also play on the etymology. It means versus unum, towards the one. Uh, normally, the university is the place where you can integrate all the fields of knowledge within the perspective of a tahid, which is the very essence of metaphysics. We have that in our tradition. Unfortunately, we go through Western systems, either in the West or in the Islamic countries where the Western system has been imported, and we train people who are fragmented. They are just studying one thing, and they, they are very anxious about the whole perspective because they don't have the, the training in metaphysics. So back to metaphysics, back to metaphysics, especially now that we are facing uh, a very specific moment of the history of the humankind. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, challenged by many different crises at different levels. Uh, an economic crisis, a social crisis, and a cultural crisis, all the crises, and uh, obviously also the, the crisis of the, our relationship with the environment and with the, the, the sacred character of nature. And so we have to train our young people to address these questions, not the questions of the past century, but the forthcoming questions. How are we going to share limited resources uh, in peace and justice on this earth? And for that, we need metaphysics. We need to understand that the meaning of our lives is not consuming or over-consuming. It's the embellishment of the inner self. And that's metaphysics which is teaching us this lesson. Um, Dr. Nasser, earlier, Dr. Guidardoni made a reference to the scientific interpretation of the Quran and uh, was, was critical of it. But I, I think maybe the audience would benefit maybe from a, a, a few more minutes of discussion about what, what is this thing called sci the scientific in a tafsir al-ilmi, the scientific interpretation of the Qur'an? Because the Qur'an, as everyone knows, is replete with references to the world of nature. The Qur'an swears many oaths by different parts of the world of nature. And some commentators really went very far in, in um, trying to make modern science and the Quran somehow coincide or have a very particular relationship. I was wondering if you could just say something about the history of that and its ramifications. I'm glad you brought this issue up because this issue is really an intellectual weakness and even evil that still exists in, in the Islamic world in certain quarters. It began in the 1890s in Egypt. And a person who was professionally a doctor called Al Iskandarani wrote a tafsir al Quran based on scientific interpretation of verses of the Quran which pertain to the science of that time. At that time, already, since the science was coming from the West, since the West was powerful, and the military machine was destroying the Islamic uh, forces wherever it went, it, a power is usually brings with this obedience and respect, unfortunately. A lot of Muslims in their heart had respect for modern science without even knowing what it was. It began in the 1890s, 80s, 80s, 90s, in India a bit earlier. Anyway, uh, India had nothing to do with this particular issue. After al Iskandarani's work, a number of apologists, you might say, in Syria, other places, then in India itself, and in Iran in the 1830s and 40s, began to write commentaries defending Islam on the basis that the verses of the Quran accorded with scientific theories or, or truths. Now, this is something uh, of a suicide. Because people who know science know that uh, the results of modern science change all the time. If you read al Iskandarani now, it, it sounds absurd. Because Newtonian physics is no longer accepted. Even said that it said Nursi the famous uh, uh, Turkish 
commentary on the Quran and his early treatises on the, uh, the Nursi treatises. He would defend the Rabbi Newtonian physics as a kind of a proof of the reality of Islam. And then he realized, realized was stupid, he said, I'm, I'm a new Nursi. Uh, this was very prevalent. And also the idea of taking pride in the fact that Islam developed science. And it goes, uh, the, the logic, if you reduce the cynicism, would be the following. The West is great. The West says that science is great. Therefore, science is great. Islam produced science, therefore, Islam is great. So, Allah Akbar is reduced to Al Qarb Al Akbar. Uh, it's the West that is great, not Allah. That's the idea, the gist of the whole argument. And uh, it's very dangerous, it still goes on. In my own country, Iran, if somebody invents some gadget, I was one, many of the president of Iran's leading university in, in sciences, uh, which is now called Sharif University, the most brilliant uh, young Muslim scientists and engineers were there, unbelievable, as uh, half of them are now in uh, Stanford and, and MIT. Uh, the, uh, if someone invents a machine, you know, not only does it get an award on television, but there's a great contribution to Islam. Well, it's not a great contribution to Islam at all. The machine could cause a, a lot of harm later on. But the idea of being, taking uh, pride in that we're doing what the West thinks should be important well, because the West is, is, is important, because we have an inferiority complex toward the West. Let's sit down and take a mirror in front of our face and realize it. We have to overcome the inferiority complex. And we have some brilliant uh, young Muslim minds. I have, a, I have a lot of hope in them. But it's important that they be weaned away from this drug that they have been given without their knowing it in their education and try to stand independently on their own feet and be able to be critical of not only something that Western science might say wrong or do, does wrong, but also of the Islamic interpretation of that. Whereas you are a young Muslim scholar, you know where was the reverse is taking place in this country. We have a lot of young Muslim scholars who have gone to the field of Islamic studies. And they make the Western interpretation of things Islamic, but with an Islamic name, the way of getting ahead in the academic world, which is a very, very dangerous thing. But uh, the West, there's the motto medieval West, which I love, that says, Winked omnia veritas. The truth has always trial, inshallah. Dr. Gider Donio, in the couple of minutes we have left, is there more that you would like to say on the subject of how the sacred scriptures and their relationship to the world of nature and how it is that Muslims in some cases get it very wrong as to what that relationship should be and like how they really should be approaching it? Sometimes people come to, uh, to me uh, and they ask me this type of questions. Students in science who are Muslims, young Muslims, about uh, which one is true? Is uh, science true or is religion true? And the, the, the point is that maybe we have to think a little bit more about what truth means. Because truth in science has a bit vanished during the uh, 20th century. As you know, we can't say that our theories are true. They are corroborated by the facts until new facts appear and we have to change our theory. So that means that science, uh, it's, it's more than mere opinion, but it's not truth. It's just something which works, which works until it is disproved by the facts. If we have that in mind, we, we can put science at its proper level in the scale of knowledge. Whereas a religious truth is the capability of religion to lead us in our spiritual journey to the contemplation of the one who is the truth, that is Al-Haq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the definition of religious truth. The, all the doctrines, all the practices of religion have a single goal, that is, bring us to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of truth. So if we have that in mind, I think that we, we, we are not, uh, uh, we, don't, we should not have troubles 
with science. We should, on the contrary, use science for what it is. That is maybe for practical purposes, maybe for uh, the amazement in front of a, of a beauty of nature, of a beauty of a cosmos which is unveiled by science, but it should not change our hearts and it should not uh, put us uh, astray from the spiritual journey because this is the most important thing that we have to, to do uh, in our lives. We, we do not have any guarantee that we can understand everything in the world. But we have a promise in the Holy Quran that we will face God and we will know him. This is something which is amazing. Alhamdulillah, thank you. Please join me in thanking our speakers for a wonderful panel. Thank you so much.